Maybe let's just start with your second month in office. Uh, what's been your, some of your experiences so far? So I've been settling into the role, um, understanding the structure of presidency, how government uh, works from a different perspective. I mean, I've worked in government before, but in an agency, and I think being in the heart of it, you need to understand how it all comes together. I think one of the highlights um, so far is a recent one. Um, last week and over the weekend, we were invited to the G7. Uh, we're not a member uh, of the group of seven um, advanced countries, but they have an outreach um, session where they invite selected countries uh, from the continent. They invite to South Africa um, and Kenya. And so the theme was around the blue economy, uh, Canada being very interested uh, in the ocean's economy and um, also in conservation and environmental issues. So we went over, the president was invited uh, with um, Minister Edna Mulewa on the environmental affairs side. And so we made a, we, you know, we, we really capitalized on it. Um, on the way to Quebec, where the summit was being held, we um, stopped over in Toronto and had a session with business people who are based in Toronto. We took a few of our own uh, and engaged with business people and we had, you know, some of the major um, Canadian businesses and investors, Barrick Gold, Eaton, um, quite a few across a range of sectors, mining particularly, but also financial services, pharmaceuticals, manufacturing. And so they just had an open engagement with the president about some of the pressing issues that they see and also just their renewed sense of optimism um, about South Africa. So uh, they ask questions, you know, around policy certainty, around land reform, as you'd expect. Uh, but they were also very positive about the potential of South Africa. Then at the G7 itself, we had bilateral meetings with a few of the G7 and other heads of state. So we engaged with uh, President Uhuru Kenyatta from Kenya, who was also invited, um, just about intra-African trade. And we're hoping to have an investment um, conference uh, focusing on East Africa in Nairobi later in the year. Uh, we spoke to uh, President Emmanuel uh, Macron from France. Uh, and he also made some commitments to support us with our investment drive. Uh, same with Prime Minister uh, Justin Trudeau. He uh, was very enthusiastic about South Africa, very knowledgeable about South Africa. Uh, you know, uh, quite a fan of Trevor Noah. Really? <laughs> Even yeah. mentioned that he's he like, you can't have Trevor Noah back. Mm. Um, so he, you know, and he commended you know our. Uh, except for the president, all-female uh, delegation uh, that met with him. And uh, we just talked about how Canada and South Africa could deepen its uh, trade and economic relations uh, because that's a very important market. I think often overshadowed by, say, the United States, but also a very rich OECD country, uh, which has actually a lot of lessons for us in terms of mining because they have been able to um, develop exploration um, and mineral resources and, and financing um, that comes to that they've, they've crafted innovative instruments. So it was quite a good exchange. Um, they also, he's going to be in Nairobi for an ocean summit. Maybe we can get him over. Um, so, you know, we, we talked um, and we met also with uh, Vietnam, with Norway. So it was quite um, an Angela Merkel, how can I forget that, <laughs> Chancellor Merkel. Um, she was also very enthusiastic about South Africa. But just highlighting that, you know, there are lots of German companies already in South Africa. They want to expand, but we have to have efficient investor relation and protection services um, that will ensure that. So I think that trip was quite a highlight. It, it kind of underlined that major economies are still enthusiastic um, about South Africa. We just need to get our act together and present a compelling investment case. So you're uh, overseeing or coordinating the four investment envoys. And of course, there's this ambitious target of over one trillion rand in foreign investment over the next five years. Where do you see domestic investment playing a role? Are there kinds of strategies to reach out? Yes. So we don't want to be too prescriptive because investment is investment. And we, if people really have legitimate, legal, viable projects, they should go ahead. Uh, we're not going to set you know, targets per sector or per source. 
But we do see local investment being a very important part of it, uh, almost the foundation of it. Uh, because obviously the local business sector are established businesses that are already in the market that are, by some estimates, sitting on a trillion rand of cash um, and have not uh, found it attractive to invest in more productive activities. I think it would be unfair to say they haven't been investing at all they have, but more on maintenance kind of investment, just keeping up current production, not so much into new areas and new productive capacity. And so we hope that by settling a few short-term policy issues that can be settled in the short term and also just boosting confidence to say other things are in play for the long run uh, to be resolved in the long run that uh, local investment uh, will come into play so it is a very significant part uh, we're also hoping for investment from the rest of the continent uh, because often south african companies have gone out to invest uh, but there are lots of prominent um, companies from the rest of the continent, uh, billionaires in other African countries who should also come um, and see the opportunity to invest um, in South Africa as neighbours. Uh, we, we are going to sign uh, the Continental Free Trade Agreement, you know, moving towards a sense of a Is common that market. next month? Um, I can't confirm the exact date, but we are certainly, there is no barrier at all. We are certainly going to sign it. It simply had to go uh, through internal processes. Um, and so we're hoping continental investment and then obviously um, more broadly international investment uh, will be part of that 100 billion. Mm -hmm. President Cyril Ramaphosa in his New Deal speech in November spoke about reaching a possibility of reaching 3% economic growth. Do you think that's still a possibility for 2018 given our first quarter shock as it's been called of a 2.2% contraction? So, I mean, I think we need to contextualize um, the first quarter uh, GDP results. Um, I mean, there was also a shock <laughs> in the last quarter of 2017, um, though it was a, because it was a positive shock, we didn't talk too much about it. But of course, when, when you have such a positive shock, it does, um, and possibly driven by once-off events, it does set up a high base. Uh, then for, for the first quarter, which was difficult to maintain. Um, so there's that base effect. But I think also beyond that, the, the general direction is negative and we need to address that. And the figures did show that in terms of um, mining, certainly agriculture, manufacturing, there's still you know, significant weaknesses. And we need to kind of focus on restoring um, investment in those sectors because that's really the only thing that's going to drive uh, growth and, and ensure that those sectors uh, pick up. Um, I think the rest of the year is unlikely to yield um, similar um, surprises, um, but 3%, um, you know, we'll have to see what happens in the second half of the year. Uh, once, first of all, this strange Q4 2017, Q1 2018 um, anomaly is kind of corrected for, and then we see how the second half pans out, especially with a lot of um, dialogue um, and towards the job summit, towards the investment summit, um, that I think will clarify a lot of issues and you know boost confidence and just kind of um, settle everything for now um, that you know more short-term kind of investments that have been pending um, can come into play. So, I mean, well, let's see what happens in the, in the second half of the year. I think the first quarter needs to be put in context, uh, but of course we can't ignore um, the important message that it is signaling about the economy, that there is renewed confidence, there's a renewed sense of hope, but we do need to accelerate uh, in fixing something so that it's backed up by actual um, outcomes and performance. And what would you say are the top three things that need to be fixed urgently? Oh. If you had to choose only three. <laughs> but you see, you can't so choose only on three. <laughs> I mean, we have this vast... Um, we have so, a, so what in the short term do you think needs to be uh, sorted out? Look, I mean, some things have already in play. Mm -hmm. So the visa and work permit issue is already in play and will probably be sorted out uh, in the short term. Um, the mining charter has advanced 
and that that uh, could also be um, resolved shortly um, in general the investment climate um, you know there's a project underway to try and improve uh, performance on the World Bank Ease of Doing Business um, survey. I mean, we shouldn't fetishize the position so much. It's more the direction and seeing an improvement, I think that matters. And so if we um, resolve some of the simple things um, that keep our score low, um, like for instance, automated applications uh, when setting up a company for certain payroll related issues, that sort of thing, I think we can easily resolve. Um, and I think it would make it easy, or it would send the right signal um, if we start performing on that score. And in the longer term? Some um, of the longer term measures that you would see, foresee? So in the longer term, um, there are various proposals across government that we need to consolidate. I mean, let me step back. We have the NDP, which um, runs or has a vision until 2030. But it obviously needs constant revitalization and updating. So there's going to be um, a paper on revitalization of the economy, uh, just the economy section um, of the NDP to kind of highlight some priorities in the short term. There's also a general conversation within the economics cluster um, around measures, especially microeconomic measures um, that can be taken to also boost growth. Um, for instance, you know, my other world, um, if you think about the competition regulation space, um, there's an amendment um, that's kind of w it working its way through the system that would give the competition authorities more strength uh, or make their recommendations binding uh, for market inquiries. So it would be more from a policy rather than punitive or reactive? Yes, absolutely. So rather than waiting for companies to do something wrong and also acknowledging that some anti-competitive issues are not private sector driven but could actually be regulations or government action. A market inquiry looks at all of that, you know, holistically. Um, and so it's important that the findings have some weight. And so there, there are recommendations around that. And I think I would also just like to see a general institutional strengthening um, of the competition authorities, which I think would then open the economy. Um, a, help big companies compete more, even entrants uh, coming into South Africa, but also then local small companies and new entrants uh, being able to, to participate more. So I think there's a lot coming from that microeconomic economic regulation reforms. So I think we also need to think again around how we regulate uh, mobility and transport. Um, there have been proposals in the system that I think we need to process. Uh, perhaps a regulatory authority in, in the transport sector. To set prices. Previously also I'm going to refer back again to uh, President Sol Ramaphosa's New Deal plan in November where he spoke about uh, really the focus on manufacturing and speaking about import substitution industrialization. Do you think there could be a place for protection or some kind of tariffs on South Africa's manufacturing industries? Okay. So, I mean, if you look at the state of the nation, it, it was very much um, when it comes to manufacturing, acknowledging that we are losing um, some of our manufacturing base and through investment, partly, uh, we can uh, restore some of that. Um, tariffs, I mean, I think at trade policy, you have to consider what other countries are doing. I mean, it's literally trade, so it's it's multi-sided. Um, so we don't want to invite retaliation uh, from other countries. We also don't want to undermine um, the multilateral trading system at a time when the US and others have um, been aggressive in unilaterally raising tariffs, um, threatening some of our trade agreements that, that we've gone into. So I think we need to tread carefully. Um, I don't think there's room necessarily uh, to increase tariffs other than protective measures where we feel our products are under threat uh, and using what is already provided for in WTO rules, um, um, anti-dumping and that sort of thing, where it can be justified. But I don't think, 
I don't think the idea um, the president has is towards protectionism. Um, I think it's to, to, to actually integrate South Africa more into global value chains, um, which requires some openness from us if we expect openness from others. Um, I think the only challenge is that we've been very integrated as consumers. Mm. And so we need to do the opposite, be integrated as producers. Mm. Uh, but you can't close your market to achieve that. We just have to find ways to be more uh, competitive and also develop areas where we have niche capabilities or even resources that are not found elsewhere. I mean, if you think about, I mean, platinum is, is not the best example given the challenges it's going through. But if you think about many other deposits, uh, manganese, for instance, we South Africa has chrome. South Africa has uh, some of the world's greatest deposits. That's just a natural um, resource advantage, which we need to translate into more efficient exports uh, of those commodities and also adding value locally to those commodities and then exporting. So to achieve all that, you know, tariffs don't even come into play. Of course, we have a localization strategy, but I think that's also defined and targeted um, to, you know, if we have a mega project, it makes sense that we try to make sure that most of the inputs come locally. But I think a lot of what's going to make us stand out internationally actually comes bottom up, building capabilities and then being more productive. Where do you foresee the role of state-owned companies in South Africa? There's been so much talk about could they possibly private, be privatised? Is there a place for par private equity partners? Do you think that, besides for, aside from fixing the governance issues, do you think that they should remain fully within um, the realm of the state? Um, so there's a lot of work that's done in, that is in play um, around fixing the governance and ensuring that they're more efficient and that they play their role. I mean, you know, speaking to, for instance, we were speaking to EU ambassadors um, and they were raising issues that their companies face. Uh, and a lot of them came down to state-owned enterprises and corporations and the um, level of service they provide to their companies that undermines their competitiveness. So that's very important. Um, but then on the second level, once they're stable, what do you do? Um, and I think that's a different discussion um, that needs, you know, I think still needs a bit more deliberation and just a fact-based understanding um, of what can um, be provided with partnerships from private sector and on what terms and how the state still manages to maintain control and influence uh, once that happens. Should they be used to drive development? Much like, say, um, the party government used ESCOM and ESCOR and the predecessor of Transnet. So that's very important. I mean, you know, the, the conversation I was alluding to, it was people talking about, you know, the water infrastructure, the transport infrastructure and how it supports their companies mm -hmm. or doesn't in, in some instances. So there's definitely a developmental role because they set kind of the operating environment. Uh, for business and also there's a service delivery um, mm. uh, role that they play which is also um, developmental. Um, now I think they have to continue uh, playing that role. The issue is around clarity around how do they ring fence those things that are perhaps not commercial and that could never be attractive mm. to a private investor. Mm. And, but then how do you give something over to a private investor um, and without hollowing the base for the developmental parts? I think that's kind of the, the question that needs to be resolved. Um, the advisory council will soon start its, its work. And I mean, you know, the good thing about that is that it's got, it's, it's got government, but it's also got experts um, from outside government who can challenge some of the thinking and come up with models that illustrate, you know, how would you balance the developmental aspects, um, have elements of cross-subsidy where it's um, appropriate, and also have private uh, participation, and, and to what extent you can do that without um, undermining your general public policy goals. 
I just want to switch now um, to uh, some comments you made about our tax policy. Um, I think it was in February, just after the budget speech, and obviously you're commenting as a private citizen then, um, where you said that you didn't necessarily think the value-added tax hike was so, in that it, 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 it was kind of on everybody, and you thought there was some place to put a wealth tax on. Uh, are you satisfied with our tax regime at the moment? Could you see the tax regime changing towards a dedicated tax on assets and not just income? So this is something that's been debated for a while um, as to whether we have adequate um, taxes on wealth. Um, and I think you know, in, certainly in this budget, the, the outcome was to focus rather on value-added tax. Uh, but there's a panel that's been put in place to deal with some of the concerns um, that I and many others had um, around um, this idea that we have a progressive tax system, which is meant to um, act in a way that it, um, the wealthier segments of society um, subsidize public provision um, and also that tax doesn't fall on the poorest people disproportionately, um, that there's proportionality. And so, that, you know, increasing VAT didn't seem to be the best idea if you want to maintain that kind of principle. But there's work that's, that's, that um, that panel will do to try and understand how it impacts uh, on the poor and how to mitigate any of that so that we maintain our principles of a progressive tax system, especially in a highly unequal society. You know, in a, if it was a middle class society, you would be less concerned um, about these kinds of issues. Um, in terms of wealth taxes, I think, you know, maybe it's time we just step back and assess the whole body of work that came out of the Davis Tax Commission. Because I think we're having lots of separate discussions small business discussion that happened 24 months when that paper came out and another discussion uh, that happens when another proposal comes out. Now that the, the whole body of work has come together, I think um, kind of digesting that within government and then thinking what kind of what's the next step. So I don't have definitive answers there to say our tax policy is here or there. I just think there's a significant project that's just um, concluded that maybe we need to reflect a bit more on. And to carry on with the issue of taxation, I suppose, are you, are you currently satisfied with where we are with fiscal consolidation, with 52%, I think, of um, debt ratio to GDP? Or do you think there's space to grow it slightly if we're going to focus on a growth sector necessarily, to take on debt to fund a growth sector? No, I don't think there's space to take on um more debt in, in that sense or in a way that will increase the ratio beyond what's already incorporated in current medium-term frameworks which actually are planning obviously for a downward trend. Um, I think it's just working better with, I mean I suppose that debt informs our budget and so working better with the budget to ensure that we spend on the right priorities but there's certainly no scope to say oh we have this attractive project let's take on more debt. I don't think um, that's that's possible. We, I th we absolutely have to work within the current envelope. Just an update, if possible, about where the job summit is at, the investment summit, and then also the um, World Economic Forum founder Klaus Schwab bringing those hundred business people to South Africa. Okay. Where are those three processes? At? So the job summit. Um, there's been engagements at NEDLAC um, around um, just setting it up. Um, and getting the different uh, social partners to then go off and um, think about their contributions. The idea being that it's a problem-solving summit. We're ans asking the, answering the question, how do we um, create significantly more jobs um, in South Africa? We've had job summits previously. So there's also a colloquium coming up soon that will just focus people on trying to understand how do we make sure that the summit is different and that the commitments that the different parties make towards job creation are actually implemented? I think if we answer that, how is it different? And then come up with three or four or five priorities that we're going to focus on, um, that would be great. And then it sets us up for the investment summit uh, where we can say, okay, this is our plan as a country. So now this is the financing of that. The Investment Summit, there's going to be lots of events um, leading up to it because it's meant to be an announcement of some deals 
um, that are in the works by then. Um, and you've mentioned one key milestone in that. Um, Klaus Schwab is organizing the World Economic Forum mm. to hold a special session for South Africa, mm. uh, an investment roundtable with the president, key ministers, and business people who are mostly their members, uh, but there'll also be other business people um, to focus on, you know, how do you, um, the very various topics um, around emerging trends, the fourth industrial revolution, inclusive growth, but bringing them all back to then how do you craft an investment strategy that speaks to all of these issues and also have those people in the room reflect on their investment plans uh, for South Africa going forward. So you, you'll have many multinationals and local big corporates and we can kind of have a QA and a um, about the policy questions they have but also around their, their plans for investment. How do you deal with the issue of land when it comes up, the land reform debate? Um, how we deal with it is just to be frank um, in that it's a historical issue that we have to deal with. Um, it's been going on, or, or rather we've had 23, 24 years of um, land reform practice which hasn't necessarily yielded the outcomes that people want to see. And now we're asking the question, is the constitution a barrier to that? Um, a lot of analysis, for instance, if you look at the high level panel report, uh, that was convened under president, former President Watlante, um, had a very extensive analysis of land reform and came to the conclusion that you don't need a constitutional amendment. And also, um, there have been many analysts, um, Temek and Gugaitobi, for instance, uh, who've argued that if you read the constitution as it is, um, there is already scope to expropriate without compensation if you can justify it along those elements of just and equitable compensation. You know, it reminds me a bit of, say, you, you're setting up a fine, in, for instance, in competition cases. There are criteria you come up with, and you could possibly come up with a zero fine in instances where the company is about to collapse, etc., etc. You know, the same kind of reasoning. You can look at the factors in Section 25 and say, given the history of the use of the property, how it was acquired, any state support that had been provided in the past, we conclude, therefore, that compensation is zero. Mm -hmm. um, and it would be rational, argued out, and with obviously the um, benefit of due process and that's all already provided for uh, but then of course on the other hand there are people who argue that well if if that was the case it would have been done therefore there must be some impediment so you do have the parliamentary process which will try to settle that question um, I guess what, what is clear to me is that there's, because that question even arises, maybe there is scope for just clarification. Either clarification by testing the provisions as they stand, which is uh, part of um, the governing party's plan um, and an approach to, to land reform to say, let's test what's um, happened, uh, let's test what we have now, but test it uh, with. Um, expropriation without compensation, whereas in the past the tendency has been to pay top market value. Um, on the other hand, there might be an argument to say maybe it should be written explicitly into the constitution that you can have zero compensation. Um, I don't know how you know legal minds would think about such a very specific thing to write, but I think that the the, the process in Parliament will take us some way um, towards um, resolving that. Mm. And then I just wanted to ask you a final question um, about uh, a typical day, <laughs> a lighter question, <laughs> a typical day in the life of an economic advisor to the president. Is it very hectic? Is it very busy? Do you meet with lots of very important people? Um, well, it's still very new, so I haven't quite come up with a typical day. I mean, sometimes I think I'm, I'm about to have a typical day and I plan it out and then I realize actually I need to be in Cape Town. <laughs> this has been the biggest <laughs> thing to learn, uh, kind of when everybody moves to Cape Town for Parliament and when everybody's back. Um, but yeah, so there's, there's a lot of travel. Um, I mean, it's, I suppose being an economic advisor, there's lots of engagement with uh, business, uh, with labor with entrepreneurs, with people just um, 
engaged in yeah in, in business and either who have concerns or who are feeding into processes um, that are underway so uh, yeah a day could be uh, you know spending time with a group of ministers then as I've just done this morning with um, EU diplomats um, and then doing an interview <laughs> and then lots of correspondence um, yeah Oh, it sounds quite like a hectic day. It sounds like <laughs> lots of hectic days, so all put together in one. Yes. <laughs>